After the break, confirmed for the first time the major setback connecting HS2 to Euston, tunnelling has been postponed. Tonight, confirmed for the first time the major setback connecting HS2 to central London. Building on the tunnel to Euston will not begin next year as planned, despite years of disruption for those living and working nearby. Anger is one thing and uh, loss of uh, trade is a big thing. It doesn't make you sick. It wasn't worth destroying our park and cutting down our trees. Also ahead, cracking down on the knives used to cause maximum damage. The families of victims ask why it wasn't done sooner. Plus... I'm praying for a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Make or break for the Blues. Can Chelsea turn the tide after a terrible run? And marching through the streets, a sneak peek at the After Dark Coronation rehearsals. Good evening. HS2 has confirmed what was becoming painfully obvious for the families and businesses who have endured years of disruption. Work connecting the high-speed railway to Euston will not be starting next year as planned. The government had previously announced focus would be switched to building the route into Old Oak Common from the north instead. With an indefinite delay to the building of the £1.2 billion tunnel, residents and business owners have been left furious and wondering whether all the planning and building work carried out so far has been for nothing. With the latest, here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. Europe's biggest construction project is in a hole and they've decided to stop digging. HS2 bosses have confirmed the planned tunnelling operation to connect Euston and Old Oak Common has been put on indefinite hold. It means the high-speed line from Birmingham will terminate in West London for the foreseeable future. For six years, Robert has had to live next door to a building site. It simply means that uh, we can't get on with our lives. We've had all this construction noise, all our local facilities have closed, people on the north part of Regent's Park Estate can't get to uh, the Hampstead Road because it's all closed down by construction works and we just don't know what our futures are. Ministers ordered the pause in work because of spiralling costs, largely driven by inflation. Businesses in Drummond Street, famous for its curry houses, have been especially hard hit by the construction work. One end of the street has been closed to traffic. Now there's no end in sight to the disruption. It makes me angry, very angry. I mean, uh, anger is one thing and uh, loss of uh, trade is a big thing. Not just for me, for the other traders here. This is like bread and butter. Most of these businesses are owned by family. Uh, it's not corporate. Two years ago, Euston was targeted by environmental activists. They occupied part of Euston Square, climbing trees and digging tunnels in protest at plans to cut down some trees to make way for a temporary taxi rank. With the project now on hold, the new taxi rank is no longer needed. So HS2 bosses are looking for something else to do with the site. One idea being considered, apparently, is a pop-up food market. HS2 said, following the decision to pause work on Euston and HS2's tunnels to the station, we are looking at what opportunities there may be to make temporary use of areas not required for the project over the next two years. Doesn't it make you sick? I mean, we need a pop-up food market like, uh, you know, I mean, was it worth destroying our park and cutting down our trees for a pop-up food market? What is the matter with these people? Work on some of the construction sites in and around Euston will come to a standstill. HS2 isn't saying how many workers will be laid off. With no timetable for restarting work on the link to Old Oak Common, it's a huge setback to the promised redevelopment of Euston. Simon Harris, ITV News, Euston Station. Next, the father of a college student who was stabbed to death in Clapham has criticised Home Office plans to toughen up laws on zombie knives. Olumide Wale Madariola believes that tightening the rules to give police greater powers to seize or destroy the deadly weapons has come far too late and says his son Malcolm could still be alive had they introduced them sooner. Anton Allen reports. Huge 
life-threatening and once again zombie knives are on the government's hit list of dangerous weapons that could be banned. A change in the law too late for this grieving father. This law coming, if it had been years ago, before Malcolm's dead, Malcolm would still have been alive. 17-year-old Malcolm Midday Madariola was stabbed to death with a 12-inch hunting knife. Under the government's consultation, the knife that killed him could be banned from being sold. That was exactly the kind of knife that was used in killing Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm's own was sold for £19.99. And uh, it was bought off of the, of, of the internet. And the, the seller of that knife is still selling his knives. Under current laws, the possession of machetes and zombie knives are not outlawed unless they feature words or images on them that suggest they could be used for violence. Under the plans, police could be given greater powers to seize some knives, courts could issue longer sentences, and the government is considering a new offence for carrying a knife with the intention to injure or cause fear of violence. But how new is today's announcement? Since 2016, four previous Home Secretaries have announced similar plans. Whilst visiting a South London police station, Police Minister Chris Philp explained how the government plans to get a grip on knife crime. But what today's announcement does is take the most dangerous machetes and zombie knives that are currently uh, legal and it makes them illegal. That means it will be a criminal offence to manufacture, supply, import or possess these dangerous knives in private. Activist Farron Alex Paul has voluntarily taken over 1,300 knives off the street. This month alone, he found five lethal weapons, but he says some young people are selling them to make money. I've even got parents that tell me that the younger children are buying big batches of knives, sending it to another address to avoid detection, then they go and pick up the knives, and then that's what they're doing to sell, to make money. Each time the government fails to ban these lethal knives, it means more parents may share this father's heartache. Antoine Allen, ITV News. There have been further reports of people stealing and vandalising ultra-low emission zone cameras in a protest against the mayor's expansion plans. This time, social media users have captured the ULES cameras completely removed from their stands in Shooters Hill. Sadiq Khan said since the end of March, there had been 31 cameras tampered with in the, exposed, in the proposed expansion zones and 12 within the existing zone. That's 14% then of the total. And the bakery Greggs says it will take Westminster Council to court after it was banned from selling late night food from its Leicester Square store. The fast food chain was refused permission to sell 24 hours a day because of fears it could lead to an increase in crime and disorder. More maternity staff, better training and clearly identifying racism. They are some of the recommendations to try to cut the number of black women dying in childbirth. Black women are almost four times more likely than white women to die in pregnancy, childbirth and afterwards. Now a group of MPs is urging the NHS and government to act. And for one of them, it is a very personal mission. Here's our senior correspondent, Ron K. Phillips unimaginable pain, um, scared. Atinake Awa's story is shocking but not uncommon for a black woman. She only found out she had preeclampsia late in her pregnancy and had to be induced. But when she told nurses she was in unbearable pain, she says she wasn't just dismissed, she was ignored. That whole experience was just one that left me feeling like I wasn't important and it's this common stereotype that we're able to take more pain. Atinoke relived her experience for a report by the Women's Equality Committee, which has called on the government to set a definitive target to eliminate what it calls the appalling inequalities in maternity care. Black women are nearly four times more likely than white women to die within six weeks of giving birth, with Asian women almost twice as likely to suffer the same fate. You don't think about these things until you break it down. Bell Ribeiro Addy only decided to speak publicly about the discrimination she faced during childbirth to help the black women's maternity campaign. The MP for Streatham suffered a stillbirth, again after a late diagnosis for preeclampsia. Things went from bad to worse and eventually, uh, you know, the most unfortunate happened. Um, and I had to give, I had to give birth uh, to, to a stillborn child. I, I wouldn't have the courage to speak about it if 
you know, the issue was getting the attention that it deserved. I understood that I had to say something to, to make Parliament realise that they couldn't keep ignoring this issue. The report talks about the many and complex reasons there are for inequalities in maternity care, but says no one should underestimate the role racism plays. In all warps of life, you know, there's clearly racism and NHS is no exception. Um, you know, my, my colleagues are very acutely aware of inequalities and, and I think everyone knows about it and are, that they're trying, but that there is this big need for a, a change in this cultural competence to understand the needs. The Department of Health says it's invested 165 million to growing the maternity workforce since 2021 and said we are absolutely clear that we must ensure maternity care is of the same high standard regardless of race. I would just say listen to black women. But this mother says change will only happen when black women's voices are heard. Ronke Phillips, ITV News. Still to come, we'll have the weather forecast plus. I'm Magical Bones. I'll be joining Duncan for a trick or two and telling him all about my up and coming tour. But now it is time for the sport. Zero accounting software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. It is make or break for Chelsea tonight as they take on Spanish giants Real Madrid. Blues manager Frank Lampard says that despite one of the team's worst performances in recent history, he says they're not broken and could turn it around later. From Stamford Bridge, here's Rags Martel. Chelsea fans will be the first to boast how they've won it all. But at the moment, this club seems to be losing all the time. Yet the manager insists they're not broken. We're not where we want to be. I think the word broken is a bit much, um, but we're not where we want to be. And that's clear. League position is a reality in the Premier League. We're 2-0 down in this game. So I think um, those things are just reality. We have to work against that. But fans seem to be turning against the new American owners. After another home defeat, supporters looked frustrated with Todd Bowley. The Chelsea chairman then went into the players' changing room and reportedly told them they were embarrassing. It's not a good season for us, this is obvious. What we have to do is believe until the end, because in these uh, stadiums, uh, things like uh, remontadas can happen. Remontadas is Spanish for comebacks. But realistically, there isn't much hope of a comeback. Chelsea are already 2-0 down from the first leg against Real Madrid. This is now a club closer to fighting a relegation battle than winning a trophy. How hopeful do you feel? <sighs> I'm always optimistic. I, I don't know, though. Uh, I just wish for the best and on to the next season. They're going to be Real Madrid. I want them to beat them by three goals to nil, and it's going to happen. You still believe. For the big, I still believe. I believe in Chelsea. Are you praying for a miracle? I'm praying for a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> a miracle might happen, but this could also be Chelsea's last night of European football for a long time. Rags Martel, ITV News. Now, when thousands of runners set off on the 26-mile route of the London Marathon this Sunday, they'll each have their own special reason to keep going. For Gareth Halls, that reason will be in the crowd cheering him on. His six-year-old daughter, Sienna, is being treated for leukaemia at Great Ormond Street Hospital. So he's one of the runners trying to help them raise enough money for a new cancer centre. Cafe Pata has more. For the first four years of her life, six-year-old Sienna was in and out of hospital. A star from Great Ormond Street worked tirelessly to treat her leukaemia. Um, it was hell. Honestly, it's, you, you, you just hope you're never in that position. Unfortunately, people end up in that position like we did. But it's awful that places like Great Ormond Street have to exist. But my God, you're grateful that they do. Today, after a successful round of treatments, she becomes the poster girl of this eight-foot-tall mural, which is all aimed at raising awareness of this life-threatening disease. Now, I never thought I'd be doing something like this, and I'm going very slowly so I don't mess it up, but 
Of course, the beauty of all of this is if I do make a mistake, uh, they can just paint over it. And when all this is done, it's meant to say, join the race to beat childhood cancer. And this mural is all about raising awareness for children like Sienna who suffer from cancer. And it's one of the ways that the charity are hoping to raise around £300 million for a new child cancer centre in Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, I think we've got four and a half hours to complete the mural, which is... The mural is part of a campaign with the London Marathon, and these artists are in a race against time to finish the piece in the same amount of time it takes to reach the finish line. Do you reckon we can do it? I yeah, hope so. Well, like they say, it's a marathon and not a sprint, and one of the people taking part is Sienna's dad. A little bit sore at the moment from all the training, but um, honestly it'll be, it's a privilege to wear the purple of Great Ormond Street. Um, um, a huge motivation to do so. Um, and yeah, excited because it's going to be a great day. Sienna, do you think Daddy Oop is going to make it to the end? Yes. Yeah. Kath Opato, ITV News, Tower Bridge. Now our next guest wowed the judges on Britain's Got Talent to reach the final and his audition was later watched by 10 million people online. Peckham's Magical Bones is here to talk about his new tour. Richard, welcome. This is exciting that you're getting to do a live audience because, of course, a lot of your auditions were virtual, weren't they, for BGT? Yeah, we did a lot of... Uh, un unfortunately, I had to be do the show during the pandemic. Yeah. So um, it was weird because it was there wasn't an audience there, so I had to perform only for the judges. Um, but now um, I can actually perform for real people. Uh, which is quite exciting. And I imagine, of course, you feed off them, don't you? Yeah, it's the reactions that really excites us. I love people seeing people's faces of astonishment, and uh, that's what it's really all about, make people experience it. So you've got dates in Maidenhead, Southend, uh, and you've just added Bloomsbury, haven't you? Which yeah, is so excited. We've got some additional tour dates. Uh, Bloomsbury Theatre is going to be in central London, um, so I'm excited about that, and there's loads more dates uh, that's up and coming. But, uh, yeah, it's been really exciting doing this tour. Tell us how you got into all of this in the beginning. Yeah, I actually started magic at the age of 10. My mum bought me a Paul Daniels magic set. Mine too. Oh, uh, really? She, ah. she bought it after bingo one day. Ah, so... But I, I worked out better for you, Yes, though. it did, yeah. So I got into it, I practised it, um, and I, I started off as a break dancer and I started incorporating the little magic tricks I learned as a kid. Yeah into street shows and it evolved from there and uh, yeah, it just grew on from there. Wow, okay, well you're here, can you do a trick for us? Then, Absolutely, please? I thought you weren't going to ask. Um, Go on. So listen, I've got a pack of playing cards here and I'm just going to fan this so people at home can see. These are all different, they're not in any particular order. Mm -hmm. uh, Duncan, it doesn't matter if I see, I'm going to give you this pen. Okay. I'm just going to get you to take one of the cards out and you're just going to write your name or anything you like. Okay. The purpose of that is that uh, this card is going to be unique from all the other cards. Um, and if you just pop that about half... Yeah, OK, that so in. I've written my name on there. You're going to that's put going that. in. And you, you're the closest. You can see that's about halfway down inside the deck. Yeah. I'm going to get you to hold out your hand for me. We'll, we'll start with this. I'll use the eight of hearts, and I'll just touch your hand like this, and I'll change it to your <gasps> card, which you just signed. Where that did one. that come from? That's not bad. We're just getting warmed up. Can you do me a favour? Put that about... Roughly again, halfway inside. Okay, I'm putting this in. I'm choosing where. And okay. just so everyone else at home I'm can see. I'm watching your hands, you know. Yeah, this is going to be... I'm going to make sure people can see this. You've signed your name there. Everyone should be able to see that, yeah? And that's about 26 cards down. Now, here's a question. Go on. Do you know how many cards are inside a normal deck of playing cards? I'm trying to remember. Is it 52? 52 cards yes. or 52, four cards if you include a joke. I'm just going to get Dr. to hold this yep, yep. and get out my wallet. I actually have 51 cards there. One right. card is missing. Inside here, if I just get this out, Go on. there's one card, not just any card. <gasps> it's the one that you just... Uh, there it is. Signed. There it is. I thought you were going to pull out a 50. I know, you, <laughs> I know what you magicians get. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. That's incredible. And I didn't see, there are no strings or anything. No I don't strings, know what's going no. on. Yeah. That, was, that was brilliant. Richard, thank you so much thank for coming. You. Good luck with the tour. Thank you so much. Right, yes. on to our own illusionist. Oh, she makes the sun disappear. I sat there with my... 
<laughs> my mouth open. <laughs> that was impressive, wasn't it? Very impressive. Well done for not losing it. That's a bit <laughs> awkward, wouldn't it? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no magic from me, I'm afraid. It's a bit of magic I'm sat here, really, given the faffing that's gone around today. But they would have needed a bit of magic last night. They were out. The people getting ready for the coronation. Yeah, I think the people. Very soldiers. close now, isn't it? Yeah, soldiers, sailors, carriages. This was past midnight in London, giving it the old practice run ahead of the uh, coronation, which is in two and a half weeks. It's really crept oh. up on us, hasn't it? It's getting Hopefully, exciting. I know. Hopefully, no sneezing there because, Duncan, it's your favourite time of year. Pollen time. Pollen season. Have you had a little... I haven't had I'm OK so yet. far, honestly. You're all right. I don't whinge, Sam. <laughs> you know that. He does, isn't it? Eek. Anyway, there is a bit of pollen, I'm afraid, in the air, and we've started to do the uh, pollen forecast. Thought we'd give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of info about it and a few tips of how to deal with it. Let's take a look. It's quite enough watching other people sneeze, never mind doing it yourself. But hay fever can turn spring sunshine into a sneezy, nose-tickling, eye-watering day. One in five of us have it, and it's often at its worst in the morning and evening. The pollen is released in the early morning. It's carried up in the atmosphere as the air warms, and then it can often go very high during the middle of the day. And then as the air cools again in the evening, that pollen will drop down again and come to the, the level in the atmosphere that we're breathing it in. There are three types of pollen. The tree pollen comes first, then grass, which most sufferers are allergic to, and then weed pollen. You might think hay fever would be better in cities such as London, but it's not the case. Plain trees, for example, can ruin a nice walk to work, as Duncan has often told me. Then there's tall buildings, which can prevent pollen from escaping, and there's pollution too, which it's thought could make hay fever worse. And did you know that the weather can help or hinder too? So if there's very fine drizzle, that can suspend the pollen in the air at the height we breathe it. But if it's windy, it'll blow the pollen away. And if there's normal rain, it'll wash it away. Though admittedly, that's not a great choice, is it? Rain or hay fever. So what can we do to alleviate the symptoms? So taking your antihistamines or whatever medication you prefer, Taking it in advance of the stimulus is the best way to avoid reacting. Maybe don't hang your washing out during those peak times. Give your dog a brush down before it comes in. On the upside, pollen creates the dazzling array of colour we see every year, but it can make some of us really suffer. Hopefully, with these tips, you might just enjoy your spring and summer days a little more. So if you want to catch our uh, pollen bulletins, they're going to be after the lunchtime news uh, and the late news. And by mid-May, they'll be after the programme. Here's the forecast. ITV London Weekday Weather. is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. I hope your Tuesday went well. I love this photo of these gorgeous baby herons. They look like little emu puppets, don't they? They're so sweet and spiky. Now, our weather tomorrow is fairly cloudy for a lot of the day, but it does brighten up later. It should have a nice evening. And then we've also got a bit of a cool easterly breeze, though. So if you're out of those sheltered spots and in that, it will feel quite chilly. But it is also turning more unsettled as we go through the week into the latter part of Thursday and Friday. I can tell you why, because we have got a troublemaker out to the east this there you go, <laughs> just moving in that front there, which is going to probably bring some showers and rain later on Thursday and into Friday as well. And then as we head into the weekend, we're watching this front move up from the south, which is also making things uh, a bit changeable. But there's a lot of uncertainty with both systems, so worth keeping an eye on the forecast. Right, as for tonight, well, we've got some clear spells, also a bit of cloud in the mix. We could have the odd shower moving up from the south, but most areas staying pretty dry overnight. The temperature's dropping down to about six to eight degrees, so not too cold, not too warm either. And then tomorrow morning, as we head into Wednesday, there might be a bit of brightness around, but there is a fair bit of cloud in the mix. It's going to stay with us for a lot of the day, but into the last part of the afternoon from the east, things should cheer up uh, a bit. But we have got, as I said, this easterly breeze, which is making things cooler, particularly on the coast, and if you're out of the sunshine as well. But highs, there we go, on paper of 12 to 16 degrees. And into the evening, well, some lovely uh, evening sunshine for you. A nice end to the day with sunset, not until just after 8 o'clock. So Thursday, we could see some showers later on in the day. And as we head into Friday, that's also staying pretty changeable and into the weekend too, actually. So do keep an eye on the forecast. We'll see you later on. Cheerio. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. 
Thank you, Sally. And that is it from us for now. Mary is here next for the ITV Evening News. But from me and everyone here on the London team, thank you for watching and have a lovely evening. Bye.